Uh, and then the second session, you're going to be in your breakout groups uh, scattered all throughout either the gym, the fireside room, or all the classes up above. And as you signed in, you should have been uh, made aware of where your small group is going to be taking place at. So it may even say it actually on your sticker, on your name tag. Um, and then the third part of today, we're going to close out with some role playing and then also close out with some Q&A. So there is actually much to get to. I feel like I'm just going to fire hose you with things in this first 30 minute period, but that's okay. So we need to pray and dive right in. So Father, right now we just ask you, would you please help us this morning to have a mind that is focused, to have a mind that is ready and prepared to work hard through the scriptures. Lord, I pray that you would give us an ability to think critically. I pray, God, that you would help us to see the value in observing your word rightly. Lord, we live in a day and an age where we want to superimpose what we feel upon to things that you've said. And Lord, that's not right. And Lord, we, what we want to do is we want to pull out things that you've already said. And we want to come to a logical, truthful conclusion. And then we want to take that and we want to take ownership of it in our life. And we want to live it out. And then we want to share it with others. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to be careful and diligent with your word. Help us to be understanding that your word is delicate. And if we're not careful, then we'll say something you don't intend to say. So God, I pray that what takes place today would bear fruit for the ministry. God, I pray that what takes place today would bear fruit in such a way that at the end of the day, we would grow and we would see others come to know you and grow themselves. God, we love you, so please prepare our hearts and our minds this morning. Help us to love you with all of our heart and our mind, our soul and our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a couple of things that I want to start with. You should have a sheet in front of you that you received last time as well. There's nothing new on this sheet. Uh, you'll see on the very first side it says OBC Academy 41523. And there we have four questions, or at least four topics we're going to be dealing with. Number one is identifying the context of the passage that we're in. Number two is identifying the observations with the passage that we're in. Number three is identifying the meaning of the text. Number four is identifying the application. And again, we call it the coma method, C-O-M-A. The context is what's outside of the passage you're studying. The observations are what's inside the passage you're studying. The meaning is just saying, how can I come to a one-sentence conclusion on what this text is trying to say? And the application is obviously where you, you take it for your own life. So... Let me just run through this real briefly with an example passage uh, along with you. Would you please open up your Bible to the book of Exodus? Go to the book of Exodus and I want you to begin with me in chapter 2. We're going to work with verses 1 through 14 just for a brief moment. Okay? Exodus chapter 2 verses 1 through 14. And let's practice the coma method for a brief moment. I'm going to read the text and then I'm going to lead you in questions. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the boy was crying and she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews children. This is his sister or then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. 
Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, Because I drew him out of water. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. He went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other, and he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? But he said, Who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, surely the matter has become known. Here's your first question. Your text is verses 1 through 14 from what we just read. But what outside of your text might be helpful to know if you were going to study verses 1 through 14? In other words, is there anything that is noted before your passage? And is there anything that's noted after your passage that may help you better understand your passage? I'm going to give you two minutes, one minute to identify, and one minute to discuss what comes before the text and what's after the text that would help you understand the text. Go for it. Two minutes. You're on the clock. So what I want to do just for a brief moment, remember right now, the only questions that you are exploring is what is helpful to know from the perspective of what's outside my text? We haven't yet jumped into what's in the text. We haven't yet jumped into observations. We're just simply asking the question, what before my passage and what after my passage is there to help me? Okay, so somebody stand up and just give us an observation that you've made. Maybe there's something in chapter one. Maybe there's something in the rest of chapter 2. Is there anything there that's significant? I need someone to kick it off, and you just got to stand, and you got to share your response. Jenny Albright. Well, the Egyptians, sorry, the, 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 the Israelites were multiplying. Uh, they had new king in Egypt. They didn't know Joseph. And so they were enslaving the Israelites, and they didn't want to multiply, so the king was given that they were going to hold it. Absolutely. Yeah, what's in the pretext... And if you specifically look in verse 12, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and the more they spread out so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. So the Egyptians are afraid. 
And then verses 13 through 22 is essentially Pharaoh's plan to destroy all of the sons of Israel. Okay, so that's good. That's before my text. What about after my text? Is there anybody else who made an observation? There's something there from chapter 2, verse 15 onward that also might be helpful to know. If you have it, go ahead and stand and share. Go ahead. Absolutely. And yet right now, it seems like there's a bit of despair. <clears throat> While Moses is meant to be the deliverer, his initial attempt at delivering his people doesn't work out so well. And so what does he do? He runs. So let me just ask this question. What is it that brackets our passage? In other words, there's something beforehand and there's something afterward. And we could, we could really summarize it down to one word. What is happening David. There's a new pharaoh on each end. Okay, there's a new pharaoh on each end. Fair enough. Yep. Anybody else? What brackets our section? Something before our passage and after our passage. Both of it is right there. Peter? No, you still. <laughs> Despair. Despair. You got it. Or conflict. Right? Do you notice that? You have the despair or the conflict, the oppression of God's people. And then you have this sense of despair or hopelessness from Moses himself. And now he runs. Well, I, I, was, I tried to deliver my people, but I could not. And by the way, how much time has passed? If we've just done any research from Genesis to Exodus, how much time has passed since the ending of Genesis until now? It's been 400 years. So where is God? I thought we had the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I thought he was here to give promises to Abraham. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you a great land. I'm going to give you a great blessing to save the whole world. Oh, but God, it's been 400 years and now I'm enslaved in Egypt. So if you know nothing else, listen carefully. If you know nothing else, if you were studying verses 1 through 14 using the Thoma method, you have to come to the conclusion that you have a sense of despair beforehand and a sense of despair afterwards as well. Okay? Now let's move to observations using the O, observations within the coma method. All you're going to do here is you're going to take two minutes, one minute to look at the text again, one minute to briefly discuss it, and church family, look at my eyes just for a brief moment. In two minutes, you cannot possibly be super thorough. And that's what the breakout sessions are going to be for. All I'm going to ask you right now is make the most prominent, obvious observations you possibly can in verses 1 through 14. Okay? Ready? Go.
that I'm cutting off your conversations. Uh, but again, when we jump into your small groups, you're going to be able to go more in depth. So as an example of the systematic process using the coma method, we're just asking, what do I notice now in my text? The last question was, what do I notice outside of my text? Now the question is, what do I notice in my text? I'm going to look for two or three of you just to stand and to share your answer with the whole group. So, anybody willing to start us off? Calls for those scriptures we see faith, leadership, and um, yeah, it's all the personal motives. So okay. that's what we see. Okay. Yeah, you see, um, something is unique about his life, right? And I, actually, there's something I saw in connection with that. I'll, I'll conclude with that, but. Others, what did you see in your text? You've got verses 1 through 14 to, to work with. What does the Word of God say? Go ahead, sister. I saw that she got paid in her own child. Yeah, great observation. There's, there's a hint of redemption there, right? And go ahead, Doug. I started out with protection of Moses, somebody that God's going to work with, and then went into preparation, which spent all this time in Egypt. Learning leadership in the palace of the king. Yeah. And then preparation now by God to go on. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely there's definitely a movement of God, although correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if I even see the word God in the text, so he seems to be the the unseen mover of events that are taking place. Peter, what do you have? A little louder, brother. What do you have? Verse, verse 3 and uh, 2 times 5, we have mention of the big river, the Nile River. And then in verse 10, I drew out the water, so there's this constant repetition of the river, which is actually in context pretty ironic. Yeah. And isn't Moses' name interesting? I drew him out of water. Yeah. Because yeah. we'll see him later drawn out of water with the whole nation yeah. behind him. In most texts, he draws yeah. water. And that's an example of using post-text. You don't have to just go a couple verses after. You could go 10 chapters down the road or 12 chapters. We get to chapter 14 and they're walking through the Red Sea, right? Anybody else? One more person? That was a good goal. Go ahead. So here's something that I want you to see. If, we're, if we just slow down and we let the text simmer, you see despair before your passage, you see despair after your passage, but do you see a sense of deliverance twice in your passage? Moses is delivered, right, out of water, but then Moses makes an attempt at deliverance and that doesn't go so well. Nevertheless, you've got deliverance and deliverance twice in your passage. It's almost like that might be the whole story of Exodus. God is going to deliver a despair of people. And this is an example of how you use narrative-based literature. Because whenever you're reading narrative, the point of your text might not directly say it like Paul would in a letter written to like the church in Philippi. So you have to be more careful with your observations to identify theme... And as you identify theme, then you get closer and closer to the meaning of the text. So now let's try this. <coughs> Number three. Um, I'm only going to give you one minute for this one. But if you had to communicate right now, this, you know, you could get it wrong. We've only been here for a couple minutes. But right now, if you were, if you were pigeonholed with giving an answer... What would you say is the meaning of verses 1 through 14, and you only have one sentence to communicate it, and you can't use semicolons? <laughs> one sentence, period, I'm done, that's all I have to work with. And by the way, you can't give that sentence any type of words if it's not directly from the text. Like, you can't start telling me about the Ten Commandments in chapter 20 because we haven't gotten there yet. What's the point of verses 1 through 14? One sentence, you have one minute, go. What's that? You could use the word God because insinuation is he's moving. Okay. But I'm just saying, be careful not to superimpose too much. Okay. okay, one sentence. Go for it. What would you say?
30 seconds. My goal is three people stand in one sentence. What is verses 1 through 14 all about? Go ahead, sister. <laughs> God's hand is always working for the good of his kingdom. I think that works. Yeah. And you see that in the text. Even through the ups and the downs. Yeah. Dave. Um, that God has a plan that is not always obvious. Yeah, in the midst of despair, by the way. So now I, I'm drawing these conclusions based on what I have to work with. I'm not superimposing these conclusions. I'm drawing out these conclusions. Okay? One more person. In one sentence, what is this text all about? I've had God has delivered us in our, even our greatest moments of despair. Okay. Fair enough. Something to that degree, right? Let's do something else. Um, I'm not going to go through application because I'm assuming we're going to do that a lot in our groups. And application can be much more subjective as long as you anchor yourself to the meaning. For instance, I can't own chapter 2 verses 1 through 14 and say, you know what? I think that God wants me to tithe more because verses 14 speak directly to tithing. No, that's another text in the scripture. What this is telling me is that sometimes in my darkest moments, even when it doesn't make sense, it appears that God is still moving. And I would get that primarily from Moses' mother because she obviously is placing faith in God to do this. Okay? So we're going to put a pause on application. And for the sake of time, here's something else that I want you to do. Whenever you're reading narrative, whenever you're reading something like the book of Exodus, you have to start identifying themes, big ideas that seem to pervade the entire book. Are you with me? If I know the big ideas all throughout the book, then it's also going to help me even further in my study. Okay. With that being said, I want you to look at chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. And I want you to look at chapter, oops, chapter 40, verses 34 and 35. One more time. I want you to look at chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, and I want you to look at chapter 40, verses 34 and 35. You are finding any similarities or any contrasts between those two passages. I gave you a passage that began Exodus, and I gave you a passage that ends Exodus. What's similar about them? What's different about them? Go ahead and look at those passages. Have a conversation. I'm going to give you about... Three minutes or so for this one. Go.
Ten seconds. Okay, here we go. So I totally understand and comprehend the tension that comes with having to find an answer in three minutes. I get it. However, the goal right now is not to be extremely thorough in one session. The goal is to introduce you to these things, to get you thinking so that in the groups you're more ready to think more critically. So, I'm going to have a couple of you stand. What are some similarities and what are some differences? Maybe you only came away with similarities or maybe you only came away with differences. But if I start Exodus and I end Exodus, what are some things that I should at least, at least be thinking about? What are some things that you discussed at your table? I need a couple of you to stand. Go for it. If you just careful with the text, you see that Pharaoh is making all of these commands. And everybody sees Pharaoh as God, by the way. Well, by the end of the book, Pharaoh is no longer God, is he? Some other things that you're noticing. Yeah, um, God is still using Egypt somehow to accomplish his promises. In the midst of despair, Egypt is acting like, acting like this incubator, like Israel is still growing, right? Anybody else? chapter 40, and now they're building a tent for God, which means by implication, what have they been? They've been set free. So you go from slavery to sonship, okay? Do you also notice that Pharaoh is trying to build something for himself at the end of verses 6 through 11? What is Pharaoh building for himself? He's building cities for his own name. But what do you have in chapter 40? You have God having a tent of meeting built for his name. So you're going from slavery to sonship. You're going from God not seemingly being present. Now God is being present. You have Pharaoh trying to build cities for his own glory. And now you have the glory of God dwelling in a tent. Everything is being reversed from the start of the book to the end of the book. And that's going, that's there to tell you essentially what the book's all about. The book is all about God delivering his people from slavery and making a name great for himself. So listen carefully to what I'm, I'm trying to do. By using the Como method, you are trying to just identify the main emphasis of the text. By looking all throughout the book of Exodus, you are still looking for one thing. What is the main emphasis of the book? Okay? So using those tools, you're looking, what is this text trying to say? If I limit the text or I just let the entire text speak, what does it keep saying to me? Be a good listener with the scriptures. Be a good listener with your Bible. Listen to the words that keep being said over and over and over and over and over again. Now, last thing that I want to do with you, and we're going to close up this session with this. I want you, at your table, all of you, to have, try and regurgitate the story of the three little pigs. Okay? Try at your table to say, this is how the story went from start to finish. 
Communicate the storyline. You have no book in front of you. All I want you to do is re-communicate the story of the three little pigs. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes, and then I will interrupt you, and we'll come back. Go for it. All right. Listen up. All right. Listen up. Listen up. That one got more uh, communication than the previous two did. <laughs> All right, if you're studying the story of the three little pigs, you'll notice that you were able to remember that story because there's actually a basic chart that's been ingrained into your memory um, since you were a little child. In other words, there is a basic structure. Listen carefully to this. There's a basic structure to remembering every single story you've ever listened to. We call it plot. So let's go back to English class just for a brief moment. If we identify the plot of the three little pigs, we are going to be moving from our setting to our rising action, to our climax, and to our falling action and our conclusion. You have setting and conclusion, and you have rising action, falling action, and climax is right in the middle. So let's do this, because you discuss the story and you know it so well. Somebody stand up, tell me, what is the setting to the three little pigs? The beginning of the story. Somebody share it. Go ahead, stand. You can only share the setting. That's all you can share. They're setting out on their own for the first time. Okay, fair enough. Let's just keep it at that. You move from the setting to the rising action, or you could also say a conflict starts to develop. Rising action, conflict. Remember, you're working your way to the climax. What's taking place? Somebody tell The what? Jenny, go ahead and stand. The wolf. Oh, we don't get to the wolf just yet. I never did that well. <laughs> what's taking place they leave home and what do they do next they each build a house and one is a really poor builder he builds his house with straw the next little pig he's not that great of a builder either but he's probably better than his other brother who built with straw and what did he build his house out of sticks and then the third brother he's the diligent one he cares about his life what does he build his house with with bricks as a reader, you're like, okay, I see where this going, where, where this is going. If I were to build myself a house, I probably would not build a house made out of straw. And as you start to compare, you start to notice that things rise. And then at the end of that rising action, you have the introduction of who, Jenny? The wolf. The wolf. <laughs> you see the wolf, and as the reader, you're like, okay, this is problematic for the first two pigs, definitely for the first pig. It's probably not a problem for the third pig. Now, let's talk about the climax, the climax of the story. What's happening? Somebody share it with me. What's happening at the climax of the story? The wolf starts attacking. I will huff, and I will puff, and I will blow this house down. Boom, house number one. Boom, house number two. But then what do you have? You have the third pig, and he can't blow down a house full of bricks, right? So the climax of the story is when the wolf attacks, if you're in the right house, you're protected. Now, let's see the story start to fall, or let's see the story start to conclude. The story falls, how so? What happens to the wolf? Somebody stand and tell me what happens to the wolf. After he makes his attempt to blow the house down, you can't tell me the wolf just, nothing happens. Yeah, he goes through the chimney, falls in the pot. Actually, the first, yeah, the children's books don't share that he got eaten, but the, the original content of the story is that dude gets eaten, right? So that's falling action. Now, the ending of the story is what with the three little pigs? Victory and peaceful living and 
By the way, they all live together now because the other two homes didn't work. You have ingrained into your mind setting, rising action, climax, falling action, or some call it resolution, and then conclusion. It's there for every human story. Now, whenever you are studying Old Testament narrative, you've got to think the same way. In fact, if you go back to chapter 2, verses 1 through 14, which was the passage we looked at earlier, let's try and find setting. Are you ready? Chapter 2, verse 1, Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. Verse 2, The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. Okay, what are we introduced to? Moses' family. A child is born. Rising action. There's an issue. She ha there's a conflict at hand. What does Moses' mother have to do? She has to place him inside of a basket. The climax would probably be that Pharaoh's daughter discovers him and his life is rescued. The resolution would be that he's growing up in Pharaoh's household and now he seeks to deliver. And the ending, uh, the ending of our story would probably be verse 14. But he said, who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, surely the matter has become known. Pause right there. I've got a basic plot structure in the passage I studied because it's a story. Basic logic, you can use it for scripture, come away with truth. Now, let me reiterate one last time before we go to our groups. I started today by wanting to just recap the coma method for a brief moment. The coma method is going to help you to observe the main emphasis of your passage. Also, if you're just careful with the entire book of Exodus at hand, just basic observations will help you to see the overall emphasis of an entire book. And then last, when you're inside a story, what should you be careful to do? Look at the plot line of the whole thing. And if you use some of these basic principles, it's going to be smoother as you're looking at the scripture and trying to draw out truths. We're in a story, so follow the basic rules of a story, okay? So right about now, we were supposed to be finishing up our break. We're a couple minutes behind. So what I want to do with you is it is 9.53, and we're going to take about five minutes to transition to our groups. And then for facilitators, those leading the groups, whatever the schedule says, tack on five minutes to that. We're just robbing five minutes at the end of your session. We're giving it back to you, okay? So it's 9.54. In all technicalities, you should be beginning in your groups at 9.59. Remember, we have a session here in the gym, one in the fireside room, and all upstairs in the classrooms, okay? We'll see you there in five. Take care, guys. Sure. Join in the group. All right. If you have your Bible, let's open up to Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. And let's pray and let's dive right in, okay? We have roughly an hour in here. Uh, before we go back out for some role playing and Q and A and things of that nature. So, uh, also anybody watching this video, this is our breakout session, our small group session, where um, we're walking through Exodus chapter three verses one through nine. And the goal of this is for me to first model um, what I'm going to be teaching, and then I'm going to give you guys an assignment for you to follow through with it. Okay. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for um, an opportunity to study your word and have good conversation. Uh, God, would you please help the text to be clear to us today and help us to take solid ownership of it as well. Lord, give us, give us strength to be careful with your word. Help our minds to think and help us to enjoy one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, I have... Exodus chapter 3, 1 through 9 that I'm going to be presenting on. And then we as a group are going to work on verses 10 through 22 together. And all, all together that takes care of the entirety of Exodus 3, okay? 
Chapter 3, verse 1, let's read it. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the, Lord caught, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Okay, so this is my passage. And if I were to just begin, look here on the sheet that you have. It says context at the top. Here's some of the initial questions that I'm going to be asking. What is the context of your passage? Consider information within the book itself. We call that literary context. Also consider direct or indirect quotations to another book of the Bible. We call that biblical context. Or historical cultural information that may be given from the Bible as well. We call that historical and cultural context. Share which information she, uh, seems most valuable to your study. Okay, so if I look at all three of those questions, I'm going to be placing the greatest amount of value on what I would call literary context. Um, I don't, at first glance, see any direct quotes or allusions to other parts of the Bible, and part of that is because we're just in Exodus, right? Um, the only allusion that I might find to another book of the Bible is what's noted in verse 6. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Why would I count that as an illusion? Like, what do you guys think? How could I justify that? Why is that an illusion to another book in the Bible? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, Jesus does say that, yeah. He, he comes from the, the line of um, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Yep, you see the genealogy of Jesus in chapter 1. So that's later on in Scripture we'll, we'll find that. Um, what about in Genesis? Not just if you look forward, if you look backward. Genesis. Yeah. Jacob actually says that. God. Yeah. He is my God, the God of my father. Mm -hmm. He calls him something else. Um, when it came to Isaac, mm -hmm. I can't remember what he called him, though. It wasn't the God of it, was there was something else he called him. But nevertheless, the the allusion back to yeah. the these these individuals carry a promise from God, right? Right. Uh, continuation of uh, Keeping his promises or, or whatever, but yeah. You know. Yep. I mean, did God appear to Abraham in the book of Genesis? Yep. Did God appear to Isaac? Yep. Did God appear to Jacob? Yep. So, if anything, I can, re I, as the reader, I am reminded hey, there's other books in the Bible that have spoken about these individuals. That's significant for me to know in my passage. If I look at literary context, which is just confined to inside the book of Exodus itself, um, 
Let's look at chapter 2, verses 15 through 25. When Moses heard of this matter, he tried, sorry, when Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. Remember, he um, tried to deliver his people. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Now, and then it says, then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, why have you come back so soon today? So they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew the water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man behind? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses was willing to dwell with the men, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. Okay, guys, so I'm going to ask you the question. Um, why, why is it that chapter 2, verses 15 through 25, is really important to know as I'm studying chapter 3, 1 through 9? Like what at all, if anything, is super important to make a connection about? Verses 15 through 25. How so? You think that he would multiply his people more than the stars of the sky. Okay. Okay. And, and uh, Sean, let me challenge you on it for a yeah. brief moment. Why... Why right now are you choosing to focus on God's promise to multiply Abraham? Uh, just just the, if there's a people, how, how can that promise be fulfilled when they're in bondage? How, how will God actually have a people mm -hmm. they're in slavery and in bondage? Mm -hmm. How is God, I guess I'm thinking, how is God going to fulfill that? Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like it's happening currently. Sure. Guess, yeah. uh, Moses is alone. Yeah. Now he's in the wilderness. Yeah. He's got a father-in-law, but he's not with his people. So let's keep working with this, though. What is directly said from the pretext, from verses 15 through 25, that helps to inform us to a greater degree with verses 1 through 9? And I'm not saying, like, directly in the Scripture. What directly in the scripture is he there to? He heard their groanings. That's right. Yeah, he heard their cry. Yep. He remembers that God remembers them. So this is where I'm using pretext yeah. to help me in my text. Mm -hmm. Listen, here's why we do this. There's two ways to study the Bible. Are you guys ready? One way is to say, okay, I'm going to study this as hard as I can, and I'm going to, I'm not going to worry about what I feel. I'm just going to draw things out, right? Like, okay, the text is telling me this. God's word says this clearly because the words are in front of me. Here's the second way to read your Bible. God, I pray that I would just have... the uh, last portion of the day, and we're going to be role modeling for you a little bit another uh, conversation. It's going to be myself, uh, Pastor Kyle, and we're calling up Jeremiah Mariano. So, Jeremiah, come on up, give him a round of applause. Uh, one of the things that we want to do, or one of the purposes that we have in doing this, is to show you that 
you cannot just keep these tools to yourself. Uh, we want to show you how they can be played out in a conversation. So just so you know, neither Kyle or Jeremiah were made aware of the passage that we're going to be studying right now. And that was basically done intentionally. Um, because what we're not wanting this conversation to be is some robotic, pre-planned conversation where, okay, now it's your turn to share this and it's your turn to share that, right? The only thing that we have at our, our disposal is the Coma Method, and maybe more specifically to today, we have a plot line, right? Setting, rising action, climax, falling action, new setting, conclusion, things like that. That's all we have to work with. And if we have those tools, you could sit down with any text that's an Old Testament narrative, even some places in the New Testament, and you can just utilize those things, okay? So with all that being said, please open your Bible to Exodus chapter 14. We're going to have a natural conversation. <coughs> I hear like wind chimes or something in the background. <laughs> this is what happens when we study our Bible all the time. So, all right, let's do this. Um, Jeremiah, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. <laughs> That's your mic. On. Now it's on. Yeah. A little louder. Hello. <laughs> Let's pray before we dive in. God, right now, uh, with our people, we just want to come before you right now. We want to thank you for the day of study that we've had. And we want clear minds to see what's in the Bible, but also clear minds to um, take the application of your word home with us. Please give us uh, eyes to see and ears to hear and help us to have a good conversation. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Kyle and Jeremiah, we are in Exodus chapter 14. I'm just going to read verses 1 through 12 to start with. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Pihahi Roth, between Migdal and the sea. You shall camp in front of Baal Zephon, opposite it, by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, They are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all of his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people, and they said, What is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot ready and took his people with him. And he took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihah Haroth in front of Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt? saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Alright guys, 
based on what we've been given, we've got these 12 verses. Let's start talking about some initial things that um, you see. And also, maybe what's in the pretext and what's in the post-text that can help us too. Is there anything at the end of chapter 13, anything to continue into chapter 14 that may be helpful to us? Well, chapter 13 is when Pharaoh let the people go. Now we see verse 17, when Pharaoh let the people go, uh, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. So we know the direction that we're, that they're headed and why. I think that's important. So the story is moving on, moving along literally like direction. Yeah, and God specifically directing them. They're not just necessarily wandering in a random direction. They're wandering, they're wandering in the direction God wants them to go. That's significant for verses 1 through 12. Why? I know well, where you're going, but... Yeah, I mean, he has them encamped in a certain place. Because uh, it says, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people to camp in these places. Uh, for Pharaoh was saying of the people of Israel. They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Um, I think it's, we see that Pharaoh thinks that they're stuck. Yeah. Um, he has this, you know, they've, they've now wandered to a place, in a place now we can go get them. Uh, because there's no way for them to get out. They've been cornered. Uh, there, There's a sea there. They can't go any further. And so um, it, it's setting up um, what God is doing here through his people and, and really he knows exactly what Pharaoh is going to do. He knows his thoughts. He knows his heart. And so um, God has this planned out perfectly uh, for his glory. Um, I also, in before chapter 14, we also have, um, And the Lord, in verse 21, went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and led them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just uh, telling Moses to, to follow a certain direction. I mean, God's presence was seen and the people followed um, in both day and night. He revealed in the direction they wanted to go. Jeremiah, just off, off the cuff, is there anything just by eye shot, a quick glance, is there anything before chapter 14, 1 through 12, that you find intriguing? Is there anything afterwards that you find intriguing? Uh, no, uh, mainly the, the reason why uh, Pharaoh let them out. Uh, that's the first thing that came to my mind when we started reading this. Uh, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast, uh, therefore I will sign that. No, I don't know if that's the... Chapter what? Where eight? 13? Chapter 13, where at? I didn't see it in here, but I was thinking about uh, Pharaoh's firstborn being killed. Okay. Uh, that's like the, the reason why the uh, Pharaoh allowed them to leave, you know. Uh, chapter 12. Chapter 12, yeah. Yep. Yeah, chapter 12, verse 12, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and then I think post text, if we look at verse 13, it um, says that Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Yeah. I mean, this whole time, God has done everything. I mean, the plagues, the sending Moses, the passage that we did earlier today, sending Moses, telling him the exact words to say exactly what will happen. I mean, God has been the one moving the whole time. I see God yeah. working the whole time. Yeah, it's I all mean, his action. even the pillar leading him out. I mean, everything is led by God. Mm -hmm. uh, so Moses is just remind. there's like a reminder here. Remember what God's doing right now? Just, just wait. Just be silent. God will fight this for us. He has promised us these things. So uh, again, Moses is leading by remembrance of Look what God is doing in this moment, and he will continue to do this for us. He hasn't led us into a corner to die. That is not the purpose of what God has. 
You know, it's really interesting if we, before we dive into our text, if you just look at verse 17, look at verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 17. Now when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God is leading them by not leading them. So now look at verse 18. Here's the uh, big idea of leading again. Hence God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. Verse 19, in the middle of it, it says, God will surely take care of you. Verse 21, it says, the Lord was what? Going before them in a pillar of cloud. And then look at chapter 14. And let's see, I just saw it a moment ago. Verse 19, 14, 19, after our text, it says, the angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel, right? So in both places surrounding our text, you see the movement of God. <laughs> so that's a little bit of context. Let's, guys, let's spend a lot of time in verses 1 through 12 doing some observations. Um, is there anything inside of our passage that would be significant to take note of? And this is just on the spot something that you might be noticing. I think whenever the Lord tells somebody to tell another person something, that's kind of important, right? Where? Verse 1, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel. Um, so God is telling Moses, but then telling Moses to tell the people. Um, so there's a command here to tell. Uh, there's instructions uh, to tell them where to camp specifically. Uh, but it is, again, the Lord leading just as we're seeing and moving. Yep. He just does it. This time he does it through Moses to go tell the people where to camp. Okay. Yeah, God giving specific instructions on exactly what to do, uh, and then telling him that he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart, which will result in something else. So, based on this conversation, it seems like we're starting to hover on the actions or the movement of God, whether it's something God says or He does. The heaviest focus is on something that God is doing. So let's only look in verses 1 through 12 of chapter 14. And let's only look for the actions of God. So when you find them, support it with a verse. Go ahead. Verse 4. And I will pardon Pharaoh's heart. Okay. And then same and then continuing. And I will get glory over Pharaoh. Where? Verse 4 still. I will be honored. I will be honored, will be honored. Yeah. through Pharaoh and all his army. Okay, what else? Verse 8 again, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Okay. What else is God doing? Is there any other actions of God? second glance I'm not finding any more we have some actions of God in verse 1 actions of God in verse 4 actions of God in verse 8 how about this um, what about the actions of Pharaoh and his people or the actions of the Israelites so just take the Israelites and take the Egyptians what are they doing in the text well I mean first we see what God says Pharaoh will say okay <laughs> right Pharaoh will say in verse 3 Okay. Of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land of the wilderness has shut them in. So um, we know that God already knows what Pharaoh is going to say, what is going to happen. Um, so again, this isn't a response of God. He just already knows something will happen. And so he's telling, again, Moses to do these things because of what is already going to be. Um, is there somewhere else that Pharaoh speaks in the passage? Verse 5. Mm -hmm. Go for it, Jeremiah. Good. Uh, what is this what we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? Yeah. What is this we have done, right? Can't believe we let those guys go. How are we going to build our cities? And how are we going to maintain our power and our authority? We've just let them go. Is Pharaoh doing or saying anything else in the passage?
Pharaoh or the Egyptians. Yeah, the Egyptians chased after them, verse 9, with their horses and chariots. Yeah, I mean, verse 6, so he, Pharaoh, made them ready. And then the chariots took his army. So he was preparing. Yep. Okay. And what about the people of Israel? What are they doing in the passage? If we're just observing what's happening, we're becoming more familiar with the passage in front of us. Uh, they saw the Egyptians coming, verse 10, and they were frightened. Okay, so we know that their mindset is very frightened. So the sons of Israel, what did they do? They cried out to the Lord. They cried out to the Lord, right? What else? They said something to Moses, verse 11. They ask a lot of questions. <laughs> so, they cry out to the Lord, and then they're asking questions. This is intriguing. <laughs> do you trust God or do you not? <laughs> yeah, three questions in a row. Okay, question number one is what, Kyle? Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? <laughs> And then, what have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? And is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Um, so, and, so they're questioning the whole purpose of this exodus in the first place. Okay. And then they give a purpose statement for themselves. That's another observation we can use. There's a purpose statement found in verse 12 that the people of Israel assigned to themselves. Yeah, it says, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Okay. So, if we're looking at this passage, we've only done a couple of observations. Are we comfortable coming up with a one-sentence meaning? Do you feel like you need more? Or do you feel like maybe, just based on these two observations, we can come away with a one-sentence meaning? Are you comfortable doing so, yes or no? I mean, I can restate what's happened, but purpose statement would be. I think Moses responds in 13 when we got to that. Okay. If we're stuck with 1 through 12, let's keep doing some observations. I want to open it up to anybody out here. Rescue us, okay? What are some other observations that you are seeing in verses 1 through 12 that's in the text we haven't taken notice of yet. Other things that need significant attention. And you've got to appeal to the verse. The verse says, what's an observation we can make? Verse 8, he pursued another action of what God did. In verse 8 it says, the Lord hardened the heart king of Egypt and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Yeah, my, my verse said pursued or he chased after them. Just another action, I guess. Okay. Or See. After that. Yeah, I'm wondering if that's the pursuit of Pharaoh, but more action. Yep. He chased. Yep. In verse 10, the people cry out to the Lord. In verse 11, they complain to the Lord. Yeah, there's a bit of a contrast there, isn't there? They want like an immediate response, and they cry out, "Save us!" Yep. Yeah. You see the a contrast from what they're saying. Okay? Peter, you had something. Yeah, so also in verse 8, the action of Israel is they go out boldly, you said, or they find the Yeah. So it's interesting that they're bold, but then as soon as they see something, they change, but God remains steadfast in the ground. Yep. Yep. The comfort level has changed, and their fear has gotten excessive. And start to not see, they forgot who saved them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they go from bold to being cowards within the matter of a couple of verses. In 10, they took their eyes off of God and they looked back at the Egyptians. I think that plays in the exactly what you guys are saying. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, right? And behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened, so the sons of Israel cried out to God. Okay? That seems to be where their attitude changes. Good. 
And you guys interject if you want, but there's huge irony in the fact that the Israelites are despairing and, and freaking out in the midst of something that is in fact not a plan. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't know maybe that it's God's plan, but it, it is. They're, well, and not only is there irony in the fact that they're despairing, if we use the pretext, what has God just done? Huge salvation. Ten plagues, he's delivered them, he's done exactly what he said, now they're here. Oh no! We don't know the character of our God. <laughs> Kyle, Jeremiah, anything else? I mean, I think they're just reverting back to what they always know. I mean, this is a group of people who've been enslaved their whole lives. Yep. Um, you know, we knew that life. We know what we had to do every day. We knew how to take care of business, and we didn't die doing it. We would rather do that than die in the wilderness. So there's this going back to even comfort within their oppression, <laughs> knowing what knowing what their everyday was was in their mind better than what could be in the future and the risk that's being taken. So they're almost questioning God, like we didn't necessarily ask for this this way. We're not really sure what's going to happen, and that's more frightening than knowing what every day is going to be like. And I think that's, I mean, that could be a scary place to be in. We've never left Egypt. Now we're just in some wilderness. I would rather just be back where I knew I was going to get some food and where I was going to lay my head at night and where I was going to work each day, even if it was bad conditions. That's more comfortable than moving outside of that comfort zone into now the wilderness to just say, God, now what are you going to do? Change is hard. And anything else that you see, Jeremiah? Nope. If I just keep making observations, if I can just make this point, whenever you're studying the Bible, sometimes there's a temptation to read through it quickly. And sometimes you have to let the tension be there. I'm still not quite getting it. I need to keep searching. I need to keep searching. If in the midst of not knowing where exactly the text is going, like if you can't boil it down to a single sentence, that's okay, because you just need to wait on the text. Stay in it. Keep looking at it. Keep going. For instance, look at the last statement made again by the Egyptian, or sorry, the Israelites. For it would have been better for us to serve. Now, because there's multiple translations in the room, what's another word for serve? Does your translations all say serve? Anybody else? The word serve means worship. For it would have been better for us to worship the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Every single time the word serve is used elsewhere in Exodus, it's used in the form of worship. Isn't it Moses who went to Pharaoh and then Moses said, Hey, let our people go so that we may go to the wilderness and their sacrifice to our God and serve him there? And worship him there. Whenever serve and worship is used, it's it's either in the context of Pharaoh or it's in the context of God. And maybe they weren't willingly worshiping Pharaoh. They were just being forced to do it. But nevertheless, it's the direction and the purpose of their life. (laughs) It would be better for us to go back to our old purpose than it would for us to keep going forward with our new purpose. Hmm. We might be able to discover some meaning, even right there. Let's read it one more time. Let the text simmer. Chapter 14, 1 through 12. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Pihahi Road, between Migdal and the sea. And you shall camp in front of Baal Zephon, opposite it, by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people, and they said, What is this we have done? That we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made his chariot ready and took his people with him. And he took 600 select chariots and 
all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihahi Road in front of Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Kyle, Jeremiah, can we start narrowing down the meaning of the text? If you had to say, like, right off the cuff, we've identified a couple of things that are happening. Right off the cuff, give it a try, and then maybe we can polish it. Yeah, I mean, uh, just focusing on our text specifically and not going outside of it, I, I see... You know, God's plan is not always well understood by his people. God's plan might involve despair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is the part of God's, we see a lot of this up to this moment. Moses has been given the exact things that God was going to do. Um, but in this moment, you know, they're like, now what? You haven't told us what God's going to do now, and we're stuck in this place. So there's this element of, Who's our God and what's he going to do? Um, and, what are, and, and having to ask God the question, what, what is this for? What is this purpose? Um, I think they're just having a misunderstanding of where they're being led to. Um, and a moment of their, I think their questions aren't much different than our own questions in the why. Um, and they're asking the why. Why are you doing this, Lord? What is the point of this? Um, and that's kind of where their hearts are at. For one, they, you can clearly see that they, it says, um, is it not what we already said to you in Egypt? Lord, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. I mean, they already, you know, they were already thinking that. I mean, this is not something they came up with later on. I mean, before we even left, um, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. So I think they, they weren't seeking necessarily what could have been or what God wanted to do with them, but they were still stuck in what they know rather than looking for what God's going to do, trusting in Him, putting faith in Him, um, and really just sticking to everything they know, they've seen, they've touched, they've heard. So we're still, we're observing what's in the text, but I don't know if anybody else in the room can feel that there's still a tension and the tension is, how do I boil it down to a sentence, right? We're not, nobody's there yet. So let's keep working. What is something that we learned of today, specifically when reading stories, that we always have to keep in mind? Plot. So let's work with it really quick. Okay, all of us, let's look for the plot. Guys with me right now, what would you say is the setting of the passage that we have? <coughs> Uh, verses 1 and 2. Okay. Tell them where they're going to be at. God's speaking to Moses and he's telling them, this is where you're going to go. Okay? And maybe because God keeps speaking, maybe we can also take verse 3, right? Mm -hmm. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, they are wandering aimlessly in the land, the wilderness has been shut. So the setting is, God is telling the Israelites, this is where you're going to go. And by the way, Pharaoh is going to think that that you're wandering aimlessly, okay? What about rising action? We know the setting and the situation. How does the story start to escalate? What are some things that are said? Well, there's the, the conflict of Pharaoh changing his mind. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yep. All of a sudden, he's like, wait a minute. We just let all these people go. Right? What are we doing? I mean, that that for Pharaoh, that's the conflict for him. And the conflict of this passage is... We can't let, allow that to happen. Yeah. And so from the conflict, there is the rising action of Pharaoh preparing his armies to go get the people. So Pharaoh's preparing his armies, but even in the midst of the rising action, God is doing something. What is God doing? 
hardening Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to Pharaoh hard and suck. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where's the coffee? Where did I go? At the corner market. I'm going to Pharaoh his heart and heart. No. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Right? So you have this action that's rising. You have Pharaoh preparing his army. You have God doing something to Pharaoh. All of this is escalating. So then where would we identify the climax? What do we see? In a story, when we're lost on what's exactly taking place, the plot helps me. What's the, what's the climax here? I think at the point here where they've overtaken the camp in verse 9, and then Israel responds um, to Pharaoh. That, okay. that, that means trap them, per se. So we've reached the climax of what Pharaoh's coming to do, and now the people respond. I think that's kind of the climax of now we're captured again. Okay. Great. Like, what's this any different than what we had before? So it's kind of that we're now back to already being captured again. Well, let me just, let's do an observation here. What is the difference between the start of verse 4 and the start of verse 8? Start of verse 4, thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Start of verse 8, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. What's the difference? One's a, uh, it's going to happen, and then one is, it's happening. So I would actually, if in the rising action we have something that God says he will do, and something that God says Pharaoh will do, I would make the climax verse 8 and verse 9, because now those things come to fruition, right? The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel, as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihah, he rose in front of Beelzebub. So the climax is, is God does what he says he's going to do, and Pharaoh responds the way he's supposed to respond. Coming off of that climax, that climactic moment, can you feel the tension? Can you feel the pressure? Now, how does the story start to conclude, at least in the passage we've been given? What do we see, guys? Uh, complaints to Moses. Yeah. Yep. Complaints to Moses. They're asking him questions. So if we consider the basic plot, now let's try to come away with one single sentence. Jeremiah, you get a sentence. Kyle, you get a sentence. And then I get a sentence. What's the meaning of the passage we've been given? I mean, again, I think it's very similar to what we've been seeing throughout Exodus in general, but um, when it comes, I know, I'm just saying this is what led me there. Um, I think God does what he says he's going to do, and the people will respond. Um, I mean, that's what we're seeing all throughout. That would, that's what I would, if I put it in one sentence. Okay. Jeremiah, you want to give it a try? Sure. <laughs> You could phone a friend, too. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah is phoning a friend. Anybody in one sentence want to give us your best shot at a meeting? God controls all the plans of men. Okay, God controls the plans of men. Okay. Al? God is setting up the final judgment of Pharaoh, the Egyptians, and the Fermians promised to deliver his Ooh, I like it. Okay, nice. Say it a little louder, Al. One more time for us. God is setting up the final judgment of Pharaoh and the Egyptians and affirming his promise to deliver Israel. Okay. Anybody else within the church? Peter and then and then Audrey, go ahead first. I would add to Alan's that it's clear that God delivered them because when they're looking back, they're asking, you brought us up and died in the wilderness. Pharaoh literally died in the wilderness for his sin, and they couldn't that that was what they just deserved. So yep. it's, it's, it's kind of a foreshadowing of that as well, thinking of their choices. When they ask, can we still ask? Okay. And that's what they deserved if they if that was what they did. Okay. And Peter? The faithful God is saving the faithful people. 
The faithful God is saving a faith a what? A fickle people. Okay, so in fairness, while we're all here, do you notice that God has not actually delivered anybody in our passage? That's what I was going to get to. It's like, that's the hard part about coming up with the one sentence. Is there isn't any deliverance in the text we're reading. There is post-text, yep. but there is not in the text. So the deliverance hasn't happened because right now Pharaoh is currently has overtook the encampment. Right. And that's where we sit. Our text concludes with the people just saying it's better if we go back, right? God doesn't actually deliver until verse 13 and onward. And that's okay. So again, if we only have 1 to 12 to work with, Peter? I would say that four has deliverance because he tells them that he's going to deliver two out of those three are fulfilled. Fair enough. Because he says, I'm going to harden this heart. Yeah. And Alec? Verse 4 concludes by saying, and they did so. Israel is obeying their walking boldly, looking to God, and their eyes turned back and looked at the Egyptians instead, of the despair. Yeah. Similar to Peter on the waves. Our eyes are on God, they walk in peace, and sure it is. Yeah. And if they're really in the world, and Right. I think one of the. Go ahead, Tina. Um, I guess I would say that God leads the children of Israel to a place where they can worship Him and experience His presence. Yeah. And so they can experience that absolutely. God is setting them up to be His deliverer or to be their deliverer. Okay. Just something that I'm seeing here, I'm going to give my shot at one verse, but because if I use my plot diagram, and if I really focus on the resolution, if I really focus on how things end in my passage, I'm looking at the end of verse 12. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So my sentence, my one sentence might be something along the lines of this. It is possible that while God is trying to deliver you, you will wrestle with doubt in the midst of his plan. Or polishing up that sentence to some degree. Because while God is preparing all of this to happen, the passage seems to close with the people's problem. And the passage that is to follow afterwards is God solving that problem officially. Right? So I'm going to go with something along the lines of, God is working out his plan, but people still despair. And people despair because that's how we close the passage. Fair enough? Anybody in here? Somebody challenged me on, on what I put forward. Maybe like, uh, tweak that a little bit. What do you think? It's, it's perfectly okay. Let's have fun with it. Well, I guess the reason I said that is because in verse 4, it says, So maybe would it be fair to say, so would it be fa fair to say that sometimes in the midst of God pursuing his own glory, we might despair? You see, and now we're funneling it down to a sentence. Because God is doing something for his glory, but people have a response too, and they're in the passage. So, Yeah. 
where God, I mean, where He declares you should go, you better go. And even in the midst of your going, it might look like it doesn't make sense. How many times have we all been there? See, now we're getting into application. Right? So let's do this. We've worked through context. We've worked through observations. We've funneled it down to a basic meaning. God pursues His glory, and sometimes we are faithless. How can we own this? If you look at your sheet that you've been given, uh, your observations chart, where it says application, and it gives us all of the application questions. Let's do this. Question A, how would my passage of study have been relevant to the original audience? So if I am the nation of Israel and I am reading this, I'm thinking, I need to remember who my God is even when I fret. But let's look at the second question. How could my passage be rightly applied to people in general? I'm going to ask you guys that question right here. How can this be applied to people in general? Uh, yeah, I think if we connect ourselves with uh, the Israelites and whenever we're in a situation where we feel like God's turned away from us to not do what Israel is doing um, and to remember his promises specifically. Amen. Yeah, to remember that God is always doing things for his glory. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the midst of uncertainty, unrest, uh, suffering, uh, like James says, we can count it all joy. Uh, because the Israelites are going to uh, continue to move forward. We know that. And so I think um, they're going to grow. They're going to learn through many failures. But God still gets his glory uh, through all of that. And so I think that's where the Israelites still need to learn and still need to grow in. Is that no matter what happens in this encampment, mm -hmm. that God will get his glory. Uh, even if it is at their death. Or not. So I think us remembering that, um, that that's what God is doing. That's his plan and his purpose. Um, and if we're willing to submit to him, Moses is willing to submit to him. Israel may not be there yet. Right. That's true. But, um, but we see, we see what, that, what the outcome of that is, is deliverance. So. Let's look at the next question. How could my passage be rightly applied to people in America? So now I'm going to open it up to everyone here. Saving a political soapbox, because we're taking a risk at asking this question. But how can this passage be rightly applied to people in America? Go ahead and share. His ways are not our ways. His ways are not our ways. Fair enough. They cried out to the Lord, um, but then they blamed the men and were frightened of the men. So maybe we need to turn our eyes to God. Fair enough. Okay, and deep. The cult, if we look at Pharaoh as the culture and the ways of the world, and then you look at God's way, and it's easy to go with the ways of the world, and that's what the people at the end were wanting to do, even in their own disparity, they were, they were wanting to go back to the ways of the world. But Jesus, or God's way in this section, God's way, God's way was the righteous way and it took sacrifice and humility and belief. Yeah. I think of uh, coming of the Son of Man, the second coming of Matt Thomas. And while we see things happening in the U.S., to fix our eyes on the promise rather than the negative things that are happening in the U.S. or the things that are taking our eyes away from the promise. Yeah. Um, you know, if I can say this, I think it's really important for us to know that the New Testament uses this whole story to remind us of God's deliverance from sin, to give us salvation first and foremost. But God delivers in a whole lot of different ways as well. God delivers first and foremost from my sin, but God also physically delivers me from my enemies, from my circumstances. I want you to do this with the next question. How could my passage be rightly applied to my own church? And I want you to think of the names of individuals who are often, we're often reminded of during the weekly emails that you receive here at church. How can people within our church take great comfort even in a passage like this? And who might be those types of people? What do you think? 
and we're giving updates on them every week in church email chains and things of that nature. People that are suffering, we don't understand the purpose or why, what God's plan is. We've got people suffering, we've got people dealing with cancer in our church, people who have been to the hospital, people who have gone through difficult things. And if God is a God of deliverance from their sin, then God is also a God of deliverance from their circumstances, regardless of how it ends up. Let's keep going. Um, how could my passage be rightly applied to my family? You notice we're trying to make... We start very broadly, and we go very specifically. Ultimately, you're going to arrive at yourself. What can we learn about this passage for ourselves? Either Kyle or Jeremiah or anybody else. Applying it to my family. I mean, I like the, the contrast of Moses being obedient and the rest of Israel you know, not really seeing what's going on. But Moses, I think, is is doing that. Um, I think sometimes in our families, um, you know, there are, we're all in different places, and as we look at our family, and they may be in fear, and what is God doing, and in a place of despair. I think I know as as a husband, um, I want to I want to be like Moses. Um, I want to be the one who reminds the people of who God is. Or reminds my family of who God is, even when it's extremely tough, um, that He is a deliverer, um, and that we can trust in His plan, and that I can lead my family in that way, um, and hopefully not fall into a place like like Israel here and and do that. But even knowing if I do fall into that place, God is still in control, and He still has a plan. Would it be fair to say, especially if we're asking the question about family? Our families need to be careful with a culture of complaining. Especially if God has been so good to deliver. So maybe like you as a family can own this. Man, God was in the midst of delivering this nation. They continue to complain. And if God has been so good to already deliver your family and is going to keep delivering. Maybe there's a place for us to say, man, we as a family unit have to stop being complainers. And then the last question, how could my passage be rightly applied to me personally? I could probably take the, the same emphasis on complaint. I could say, man, I myself complain way too often when God is in the midst of working on behalf of his name, for his glory, for my good. Like God is attempting to deliver and I'm a complainer. I, I think in this passage which communicates God's glory and despair, we can start to own those things. Okay? The reason why this passage was so hard is because we didn't go to the Red Sea yet. That was the most challenging part about it. You open up the rest of the story and I think you get more application for uh, God's deliverance. Let's do this. We're going to close out the last couple minutes. We have gone over time, so we're going to um, take the last ten minutes. And we're going to ask any pressing questions... <laughs> You might have. Working through narrative is more difficult than working through the New Testament letters. By the way, give Kyle and Jeremiah a round of applause. And everyone who asks a question gets a free book. We have this book right here called Tactics. It's really a a book on sharing your faith strategically with people. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, no. six of six. them. That's why I wasn't a mathematician. We have six books, which means six questions. Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> you now owe me a book. Yeah, you <laughs> owe me a book for that. Bobby, go ahead.
either them saying like, well, that's that's how it used to be and it's not like that anymore, or even going to the extreme, because I've heard it said, that there's an Old Testament God and a New Testament God, and, and like Jesus is different than the Old Testament God. Like, if somebody were to come up to you and say, well, that's the Old Testament, and we're under a new, we're under a new covenant in Christ, why is that relevant? What would be your response? Well, my response is that you don't have a New Testament without an Old Testament, number one. Um, but you will find that the New Testament often grabs a hold of the Old Testament narratives to make New Testament points. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, if you'll just turn there really briefly. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Let's see if Paul picks up Moses. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 13. But if the ministry of death and letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory, in this case, has no glory, because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech, and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face, so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. And that passage right there deals specifically with your question. But we don't know the glory of the new covenant if we don't know the previous covenants. So I can't know what's available to me today if I have no recollection of what was available to me in the past. So it is right. Amen? And then Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3, speaks of um, this covenant having more glory than the covenant of Moses. But it doesn't say the covenant of Moses didn't have any glory at all. Right? I think it's just saying what you had in the past pushes you forward or finds greater fulfillment in the future. And then you can choose who you want to give the book to. It's still yours. You have to ask the question. Dave, do you have a question? Just one very additional point. You know, Jesus came into this saying, I have not come to do away with the old covenant, the old law. That's right. But come to fulfill it. That way we can't understand the new covenant based on the old law. And along with Bobby's question, Jesus, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. There's your son. Phil, go ahead. How does the Roma relate to the Old Testament overall? It is. The Coma method is hermeneutics at its finest. We're just synthesizing it into four points. Yep. This is Bible interpretation, hermeneutics at its finest. This is exactly what they would teach you at Bible college or whatever. Yep, there's no difference at all. You get a book. Sean. Yeah. yeah, so to speak about hermeneutics, I know one thing they say about talking about scripture, interpret scripture. I know within the text, you try to say just within the text, uh, but I know like in, with what we work through with those quotes that we use somewhere else, how much do you take the overall view of the whole of the Bible when looking at or do you bring in the whole of what the Bible is saying uh, in helping to interpret the text, or what's, you know, with the idea of scripture interpret scripture, looking at other places? Yeah. We mostly try to stay within the text. If there was quotes that lead us to another place, we you go, you go back and look at that place in the, in the text or the scriptures. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I mean there's I mean, when you're. Just from a hermeneutic standpoint, when you're doing context, right? You're going to do biblical yeah. context, pretext, which are which pretext is you could say is everything right. before that, right. and post text is everything after that. You could go to that that length. Right. Um, when you start doing that, I mean, you're you're really starting to gather a biblical theology where you're taking the whole Bible into consideration when you're when you're reading a text, which is you should do that. Yeah. Um, and then then when you go beyond just taking that, then you get into systematic. Which is right. the concepts that are throughout Scripture? You're bringing those that match the, what you're studying, and so and then you're how how all of those work together. 
So yeah, that is a really broad like study, right? But you do want to, as you study the text, know the text, and then know your biblical theology, how the text all works together, and then you can go beyond that. But that's a that's a kind of a vague answer. And Sean, I would say there's three easy principles for how much of the rest of the Bible do I incorporate into my study. Number one. Just take like 10 verses or so before your passage and 10 verses or so after. Make sure you read that. Take any direct references or quotes that's in your passage. Like when Jesus quotes something from the Old Testament, go and read that in the Old Testament. Um, or I, I would even say this, if the New Testament makes any allusions, like we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, if the New Testament grabs a hold of it very specifically, what does the New Testament say about my passage at all? So, what's the New Testament say? What are direct quotes say? What are the verses coming before and after us? Yeah, and kind of what I'm thinking is like when I come to my conclusion, is it lining up with what the Bible says in other places? Right. right. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Scripture should always yeah. interpret Scripture. Yeah. Right. Another question that you might have. Let's go. How do you come up with a passage? Great, great question. Like, how much do I bite off and how much do I chew? You're a pastor, so I mean, you focus on something. You're going to teach something, or maybe you're going to read through an entire book of the Bible. But, like, so, how do you come up with a passage? For how much you're deciding to study all at once? That's your question? Yeah, or teach on, you know, I mean, Yeah, I mean, there's there's also the, the structure of the text itself can really help, like where there are breaks, uh, or like in the New Testament, a lot of in Paul says, therefore, right? He's going into therefore because of this. I already studied this, so now I extend this. Sometimes there's natural breaks in the text, which is a good place to stop. Some of your Bibles do an okay job of doing that with headings, but that doesn't mean that's always where you want to stop. Um, but I, I, I like you said, I don't don't bite the law off if you don't need to, you know, just when the thought ends, stop there and then you'll continue on the next time. So, I mean, it's you're building upon it. And so you don't need to do a lot of the time. I mean, I would read a story through like this one. We did stop at 12, but you could go the rest and read the Red Sea and talk about the whole thing. But I mean, I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong, but I think it's good sometimes to do less. Because you can spend more time in that class and get a lot more out of it. You know, um, for Resurrection Sunday, I preached on John 20, 11 to 31. And the reason why I chose 20 verses was because I saw the same thing happening three times. In verses 11 to 18, I saw Jesus making an appearance to Mary. In verses 19 to 23, I saw Jesus making an appearance to the disciples. In verses 24 to 29, I saw Jesus making a specific appearance to Thomas. So I had to ask myself, okay, I can either preach on one appearance, or the Bible put three appearances together, and now I'm going to preach on all three appearances. And that's, that's what I chose to do. Um, second, when you're in a story, I would say if you can find a passage that holds a plot from setting to conclusion, you should take that and stop there. That if you're in a story and you have to teach a Bible study, if you can't finish the plot arc, then you probably don't have a, a big enough passage. Or, if you've got a massive plot arc, you probably bit off more than you can chew. And sometimes it's hard, but I think if you stick to, okay, I'm using the basic plot arc, and number two, like, do I find something consistently happening in story mode like I did in John, then you go with that. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're sitting down one-on-one -on -one with somebody in discipleship, which is what we're all training to do. You may not have read the passage like we did up here. I didn't read that passage before we set up here. So I didn't know he was going to stop in 12. And I didn't know we weren't going to do the whole story. But he just said, let's read 1 through 12. <laughs> okay. But I know what happens after, but I'm trying to stay in the text. But So when you're sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, you may just read it to a finished thought or the finished story. Um, and try to get through that as you're sitting down with somebody so you can kind of have some sort of a conclusion, whether you're in a narrative or in a different place. But if you're finishing the thought or finishing the story, at least somewhere to sit on, I think is good. I know it's harder because if you didn't prepare, you're just kind of reading. That's okay. Just read and, and see where that takes you. 
Um, but try not to read like 50 verses and then try to go back and do all that work. I would take it a little bit at a time. Or if you, you can study too little, you can say, I'm just going to study one verse today. And that's how you get in big trouble. Mm -hmm. Because you forget everything around it. You know? Yep? Don't you think that studying scriptures and trying, trying to dig out the meanings of the scriptures can, can come up with different conclusions for different people? Especially when you're researching a question that a person has and is sincerely asking God, like my kids that lost a little baby that was six months old, mm -hmm. three months old. Mm -hmm. Why God? Why? And then, you know, you try to find scripture and you say, well, it could be, you know, that their God has seen their focus was too much on them, a baby and one of them. I mean, there's just so many different things that you can try to research and figure out why God would allow something like that to happen. Yeah. So don't you think that even reading and studying scripture with different people can come up with different conclusions? When you use the word conclusion, if you mean application, I think Probably, yes. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. What, I, what I think is the most dangerous thing we can do is we can already have something we want to find the Bible saying, and then we can just flip through the pages, and as soon as we just see something that might be close to that, then we say, right there. But the text can never mean something to you that it didn't mean to the original audience. Whatever the text meant to the original audience, it has to mean that to you today, although you might apply it differently. So one meaning, but many applications. But there can't be many meanings and many applications. One meaning, many applications. And sometimes I've found that we can find a passage and we can be like, oh, so this encourages me to not give up hope. But the text might not even be talking about that. You might just have an understanding that there's another text in Scripture that should be about not giving up hope. So now you're just robbing from another text of Scripture and you're smuggling it into the passage you're reading. We can't do that either. We've got to come away with one meaning and a lot of applications. Last question. Last question of the day. Who's going to take the book? Go ahead. What you got? Yeah, so what do I do when God says, my people have disobeyed, and I'm ready to be done with them, and now we're getting into a big question that's somewhere in between hard determinism and something called process theology or open theology, or open theism, which basically says, wait a minute, can God change his mind? <laughs> Because in the scriptures, God actually does, in a couple of instances, change his mind. Um, but changing his mind to which extent? This is a really big term, but there's something in scripture called anthropomorphism. And anthropomorphism is where we get our word for anthropos, anthropological meaning people, or anthropomorphic. Sometimes the scriptures present God in such a way where he's still showing himself to be personal and emotional in the midst of the moment, even though he had foreknowledge of the moment. So just because God knows something in advance doesn't mean that he has to act robotically or without relationship or without emotion in the moment. Does that make sense? And because the scripture gives us this, these anthropomorphisms of God, it's scripture showing us here, you as a human being, this is the best you can understand about how God is feeling in the very moment. Now, one thing about that situation where God was upset with Israel and was saying, this is how I feel, I'm ready to be done with them, because essentially he was betrayed. God did not destroy them because of what? Because they had a deliverer. They had someone who interceded on their behalf. And that is a direct depiction later on in the New Testament of who you have in the person of Jesus Christ. God will destroy anyone who does not have an intercessor. <laughs> so the scripture is trying to show us this personal side of God, although he does have foreknowledge, 
And that personal side of God is there to prepare you for the Savior in the New Testament. It's saying that God will react differently to you if your faith is in Him, and God will act the same way under His wrath if you have not come to Him. If you have no deliverer, no intercessor, no Savior, no lawyer, no advocate. So sometimes the scripture just shows us, like, why was God grieved over the people when, when he flooded the world? Did God not know that the people would sin? Well, of course he knew. But in the moment of the action, he's still able to respond personally because God is not robotic. He's still a person. Fair enough? Now, if we wanted, we could have an entire OBC Academy which would walk through hard determinism, soft determinism, middle knowledge, and open theism, but that's going to be about an eight-hour OBC Academy. Maybe another time for that. Fair enough? All right. Camille, you get the book. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for our time, and thank you for the tension of learning new skills. Thank you for the tension of the passages that were in front of us today. Thank you for the skills that we're trying to develop. Lord, thank you for our breakout sessions, our small groups. Thank you for the body of Christ gathering here together. Thank you for all the winds. And the winds are that we're coming together to study your word because we want to get better and we want more tools to train others. God, help us to not give up on the process. Help us to continue to grow and mature one day at a time as we study our Bibles. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for today. You are dismissed. God bless you. Take care.